Hello, my name is Nolten Olmsted. I've worked at Amcor Technology for about six years now in various groups, uh, and I'm currently working in the Advanced SIP Business Unit on memory product development. Uh, today, I'll be speaking about the challenges encountered in our memory packaging applications uh, with a specific focus on our 3D NAND memory products. I'll give a brief overview of the memory market and trends in 3D NAND technology, uh, followed by a discussion on the manufacturing and packaging challenges that need to be addressed um, to maintain high profitability, yield, and reliability as the memory technology advances and, and volumes are increasing. I'll follow this up with a specific application in memory wafer dicing, um, which is utilizing plasma treatments, uh, various plasma treatments to maintain a high strength uh, for the very thin singulated memory die. Okay, so the NAND memory market is expected to see significant growth in the coming years. That market was $46 billion in 2020, and that's expected to grow to $85 billion by 2026. Uh, this growth is being driven by 5G technologies, data center applications, um, and other advanced applications such as artificial intelligence. The trend for memory packaging is expected to follow a typical pattern that we see with other advanced applications uh, where we want to see more performance packed into a smaller and smaller package. At, at the wafer level, you can see this memory density continuously increasing while original NAND technology had maybe up to 24 layers of memory cell stacked in the Z direction, wafer fabs can now increase this up to 192 layers of memory cells. At the same time as seeing this increase on the die, we can increase the density in the package by uh, stacking individual die anywhere from one die in the package up to 16 die. Uh, and so doing this requires uh, creating a very thin die and also maintaining uh, really excellent manufacturing controls so that you can achieve high yield. Now let's uh, discuss some of the manufacturing and packaging challenges posed by the demand for higher memory densities and smaller packages. In the production of memory devices, we face a number of challenges to support continuous improvement, maintain high quality, and have a drive towards zero defects. Uh, this requires a lot of information to be collected and linked throughout all aspects of the manufacturing process with unit level traceabilities for materials and processes, automation of inspection, and data analytics. Uh, looking at traceability, um, at unit level traceability is expected starting uh, even with our upstream suppliers and continuing through all the assembly processes and even being linked to processes that occur after the package leaves the assembly factory. One example of this would be recording information uh, for each die as it's processed during the die attach with information such as fab lot, wafer number, and the specific location on the wafer being associated with an individual unit and the associated monitoring data during and after die attach. Automatic inspection systems are incorporated uh, throughout the manufacturing process. As an example, Prior to die attach, the diced wafers will be inspected for any die cracking and chipping with the, the defects being identified by the vision systems. During the die attach, um, we can have additional optical inspections, uh, which can be performed to find any cracking or chipping that occurs as the die is picked from the wafer or being attached to the substrate or die stack. And finally, data analytics can help to understand the history of those individual units or groupings uh, that can be tied to overall trends in product performance. Uh, this becomes very critical uh, in quickly identifying the causes of any failures that occur and also in intelligently targeting areas for improvement and optimization. The manufacturing process for these memory wafers with an uh, increasing number of stacked memory cells in the Z direction can lead to a large amount of thin film stresses to be built up in, in the wafer and the die, which leads to a number of issues during assembly. 
uh, these higher cell stacks also mean that in the saw street there will be more materials and structures that interact during the dicing process so maintaining a good die crack margin requires a specific focus on improvement of both wafer preparation uh, the dicing process and also die attach processes during wafer thinning a finer polish can be used on the die backside which has the effect of increasing die strength um, another critical factor in increasing die strength is reducing the damage that occurs during the dicing process itself. Um, as I mentioned previously, the structures in the saw street can negatively impact die strength. So one method for mitigating this is by removing the material in the saw street prior to blade dicing with uh, laser grooving. As I'll show later, this method can be further improved with the implementation of plasma treatments on the laser grooved surface. Stealth dicing is one other method that can minimize damage to the die during dicing. Um, this process, uh, a laser is focused within the silicon to create a modified layer and internal cracking. Um, after the laser is focused and you have that internal cracking, the wafer is then attached to a dicing tape and expanded um, with the tensile stress that's applied, allowing the internal cracks to propagate to the top and bottom of the wafer, yielding a singulated die. After the wafer prep and dicing processes, assembling the memory into a usable package introduces a, a host of new issues and challenges, especially when the goal is always to achieve the highest memory density while maintaining high yield, low cost, and a small package footprint. Um, now, I won't go into each of these issues in great detail, but this slide gives a good overview of, of some of the individual challenges that are faced with, with these individual components. Starting with the die itself, the memory die will, of course, be quite large uh, and incredibly thin, as we've already discussed. So handling these fragile die requires the use of specialized needleless pickup tools to minimize stress and reduce the risk of, of cracking during these processes. And of course, automatic optical inspection is always critical to ensure that uh, none of the die are cracking uh, during the handling or die attach processes. These thin die will also have, as you can see, uh, an overhang in the die stack. So that requires selection of, of proper die attach film and mold compound materials uh, to minimize warpage and stress in the package um, and preventing failure in the final assembled package. Uh, while the stacked NAND memory are, are typically wire bonded to the substrate, a controller die uh, may be at the base of the memory stack, uh, which requires the use of flip chip technology um, for flip chip interconnects to the substrate. So increasing the number of stack die in the package while maintaining a low package height introduces uh, challenges in a number of areas. Uh, while the height of the die stack increases, um, an obvious area for uh, reduction in the overall package height is in the substrate. So there's continual improvements being made in reducing the substrate Z height to allow for higher stacking. The, the wire bonding uh, that cascades down the die uh, also needs to be done in a controlled manner. So it minimizes stress on that overhanging area. Um, and also we wanna maintain a low wire bond loop height and uh, which lets us uh, have a very low die to mold cap clearance height. So as we've seen so far, there are several different core technologies that enable the manufacturing of high quality memory packages with high die stacking and, and memory densities. With a, a goal of zero defects in mind, the interactions between these individual technologies has to be considered and areas for improvement being identified and sought after in, in each area and, and all of them together. So this can be uh, identifying raw materials for assembly, uh, or improvements to wafer thinning processes, enabling high die strength, new wafer dicing technologies that minimize 
damage to the cingulated die, as we've discussed, uh, precise die attach equipment and inspection to reduce stress, um, and even wire bond and molding processes that can yield a high reliability package with a low Z height. In addition to manufacturing the individual NAND memory packages, there will be an increasing demand for the capability to support more complex package integrations. Uh, these integrated devices such as SSDs or consumer system and package modules will provide their own unique packaging challenges and, and drive for more and more advanced design rules. Uh, this will drive tighter die placement, higher die stacking, uh, potentially the use of the flip chip controllers under the die stack, uh, which we discussed previously. Um, and increasing number of passive components, uh, the possibility of com compartmental shielding, um, and, and possibly a more integrated system and package design to manage the functionality of that device. So now I want to go over in a little more detail one of the areas for improvement that I highlighted previously, which is minimizing the stress on the wafer and the die during the uh, dicing and singulation process. As I've mentioned a, a few times now, the number of NAND memory cells stacked on the wafer is continuously increasing. So uh, this increasing number of layers during the wafer manufacturing process allows a high amount of thin film stress to build up, which can cause a number of issues during assembly. Uh, in addition to this, the more fragile uh, low K dielectrics are being required um, in the advanced silicon nodes, which uh, exacerbates that issue. Uh, also, while the device layer thickness for the memory is increasing, we also want to increase the total die thickness, which uh, means we have a lower portion of silicon in the overall die thickness, as you can see in the, the image on the right here. So one reliable method uh, that we have for increasing die strength above what we would expect to see from a typical blade dicing is the use of the laser grooving to remove material from the saw streets or even full laser dicing. Um, however, this process uh, will typically leave a large amount of debris and uh, what we call a heat affected zone on the surface where the laser grooving or dicing occurred. So there's room for further improvement. Um, and so we can look at various plasma treatments that can be used to help mitigate this effect. Uh, you can see in the image on the, the bottom right, uh, the surface of the wafer after the laser grooving in the saw street and then after the plasma treatment. So in the next few slides, I'll discuss one experiment that we conducted evaluating two different plasma treatments in various process flows. The first plasma treatment that we looked at um, we'll call the remote plasma treatment and this is a microwave plasma technology which is uh, specifically targeting uh, for removing the damage from the laser grooving and, and dicing process. So on the image on the bottom here you can see um, what the saw street may look like after a full laser dicing where you have uh, the debris or the recast on the die edges. Um, you will typically see a burr several microns tall at that top corner of the die. And then there's a heat affected zone going into the die where that area has been affected by the heat from the, the laser grooving or the, the full laser dicing. And after the plasma treatment, um, you would remove that burr material and then also remove the recast material and, and uh, remove or reduce the the size of the, that heat affected zone. The second plasma treatment that we evaluated was a direct plasma treatment targeted at the backside of the wafer. And so this is a capacitively coupled plasma um, with the ions being accelerated to the backside of the wafer to remove the damaged layer that you would see after grinding and thinning that wafer to the target thickness. So on the before treatment picture, you can see um, there's a thick damaged layer where you may see some chipping on the back side of the wafer and after the plasma treatment we would hope to see a, a lot of that chipping removed and a higher die strength as a result. 
Uh, in this evaluation, we look at three different dicing flows with and without each of the plasma treatments. So the, the first dicing flow that we look at is a, a dicing before grind and a laser grooving combination. So uh, we start with a laser groove to remove the material from the saw street, uh, follow that with the remote plasma treatment to clean up that saw street. Uh, and then we do a half cut with the blade where we uh, don't cut through the entire thickness of the die, but go about halfway. And then we do the back grind to the final desired thickness of about 30 micron, uh, which reveals that half cut and results in a singulated and thinned die. And that's followed by the direct plasma treatment to clean the wafer backside. The second flow that we evaluated uh, was laser grooving and blade dicing, where we do the back grinding first to our target thickness, uh, do the direct plasma to clean up the wafer backside, laser groove in the saw street, rem remote plasma to clean the laser grooved area, and then uh, finally dicing with the blade. The third flow that we evaluate is the full laser dicing flow. So this uh, starts again with the back grind to target thickness, direct plasma to clean up the backside, and then we do laser dicing through the uh, entire thinned die thickness, um, as opposed to simply removing the saw street material. So in this process, uh, the remote plasma treatment is targeting that full sidewall of the die uh, to remove any of the recast and minimize the heat affected zone and that, that burr that, that we would expect to see at the top. The test sample in this evaluation, we used a 300 millimeter wafer um, starting at full thickness with uh, 650 nanometers of aluminum copper. Um, and then our, our target uh, die thickness for our, our final thickness is about 30 microns. In the next few slides, we'll take a look at the results that we saw from our evaluation uh, of each process flow. Um, the main parameter that we're looking at, of course, is the die strength. And, and so we measure the breaking strength with a, a three point bend uh, on the final singulated die. Yeah, each of these process flows, we actually look at um, a couple of different variations uh, of this process flow. So we look at um, dicing the wafer just with the blade dicing, so no laser or plasma treatments. Um, we look at the uh, process flow uh, with the laser grooving, but with none of the plasma treatments to remove any of the uh, laser damaged material. And then we look at um, the process with only the direct plasma treatment or only the remote plasma treatment, and then the full process flow with both remote and direct plasma treatment. So the images on the left here show some representative, representative images of uh, what the wafer sidewall or die sidewall looked like after the different treatments. Um, you can see without the plasma treatment, um, there's a, a pretty good amount of debris um, in the laser grooved area. Um, and then you can see with the remote plasma treatment, a lot of that is removed. Uh, and you see it's pretty clean with uh, both the remote and direct plasma treatment. What we ended up seeing in terms of the results is that the uh, blade dicing, of course, has one of the lower strengths. Um, and then when you do the laser grooving and the direct plasma treatment alone, you don't really see an improvement in the die strength. But uh, with the remote plasma treatment after the laser grooving, um, that's where you see the, the biggest increase. And the remote and direct doesn't seem uh, to have uh, as much of that increase there. For the laser groove and blade dicing process flow, we see pretty minimal increase in the die strength or, or really no increase when we implement only the laser grooving in the saw street or uh, combine that with just the direct plasma treatment cleaning up the wafer backside. What we do see is in this process flow where we include either the remote or the remote and direct plasma treatments, we see a good increase in the die strength. Um, although it's not as significant as with the dicing before grind on the last slide. In a few slides here, I'll go over the 
side-by-side -side comparison between the different process flows so you can see which uh, which ones showed the greatest improvement. So the laser dicing process flow where we um, grind the wafer to the target thickness and do the direct plasma followed by a complete laser dicing, so full singulation using the laser treatment. Uh, we see, again, really no impact from using the direct plasma treatment alone. Um, and the best result we see is where we utilize just the remote plasma treatment to clean up the dye sidewall. You can see uh, without any plasma treatment, um, there's a lot of burring on the top side of the dye and a good amount of uh, recast and, and damage there from the laser dicing. With the remote plasma treatment, you see that that burring is almost entirely removed and you have a nice clean sidewall and there's really minimal uh, improvement uh, looking at the including the direct plasma treatment in there as well and you you see that reflected in the dye strength there's little to no improvement with the remote and direct plasma treatment so finally we can look at a comparison between the three flows or the best uh, best results that we got from the three flows to see which which dicing process gives the highest dye strength the highest strength that we saw is from the dice before grind plus the laser grooving. So that's where we um, do the laser grooving to remove the material from the saw street. And we do that half cut followed by uh, thinning of the wafer to singulate the die. Uh, you can see in the images on the left here, um, you can see the area where we do the laser grooving in the saw street. And then the remainder of that is cut by the blade. And that's where we saw the the highest die strength when we combine that with only the remote plasma treatment. You can see a lot of the debris and recast from the laser grooving, and then also the chipping and damage you would see from blade dicing, and that gets cleaned up and you get a nice clean sidewall and smooth uh, saw street area after the remote plasma treatment. We also saw uh, pretty good results from the laser full cut with the remote plasma treatment. And you can see the representative images here uh, where you have a lot of burring before the plasma treatment and a pretty rough sidewall. And that's improved significantly after remote plasma. And finally, the uh, lowest results we got were from the laser grooving and the, and the blade full cut with the remote plasma treatment. So overall, the remote plasma treatment was shown to be very effective uh, with the dice before grind and laser grooving or even the laser full cut process. We saw very little improvement in any of the processes with the direct plasma treatment. Um, so that doesn't seem to really yield a significant increase in the dye strength uh, by, by cleaning up that backside of the wafer after the thinning. So this plasma treatment evaluation is a good example of the kinds of continuous improvements that need to be made to address some of the many challenges faced with a growing memory market and, and more advanced technologies. Um, new process and materials will constantly need to be evaluated and, and optimized to package the next generation technologies. And of course, these solutions always need to be considered while keeping costs low maintaining high yield and, and also having excellent reliability. Thank you for watching my presentation and, and please feel free to contact me with any questions you might have.